So uh, welcome uh, everyone. Um, the uh, the idea for uh, introduction to stargazing is uh, uh, kind of a monthly get together somewhere between a course and a book club. The idea is to introduce you to the sky, the stars, the planets, much as if we were sitting around a campfire and looking up, uh, and then sort of just giving you a little bit of a, a, a tour of things. Um, so um, the original plan was to do this at the Queen Elizabeth Planetarium. So do a little bit of talking, then step outside and actually point at the real sky to do something practical. But until then, we're zooming. Um, and first and foremost, this is all about looking using your eyes. So no telescope is required, although a small telescope certainly does help. Uh, binoculars um, are uh, a really good thing to uh, get a hold of. Uh, they, they really help. Uh, one of the things that uh, we, we try and do with these sessions is to uh, follow um, the Explore the Universe uh, certificate and pin that you can get from the uh, Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. So it's a, it's a free uh, course and certificate and pin. And uh, so by all means, uh, please uh, follow uh, the link to uh, that uh, this meeting is advertised on. And there's going to be a link to uh, the Explore the Universe. Print out the, the PDF, uh, sort of follow along. And uh, after the session, go outside and find things for yourself. And in about a year or so, uh, we should probably have seen uh, and done a full cycle. And, uh, and you would be ready to uh, submit your observations and uh, earn the uh, certificate uh, for Explore the Universe. So with that, I will switch over to the other presentation. And let's get going. Loading, tick, 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 tick. Um, okay, so there we are. Uh, so um, just a, a nice uh, little reminder here. Uh, we'll uh, also leading up to uh, the following Wednesday from from us is uh, Jeff Robertson's uh, "What's Up in the Sky" this month, which also has a little bit of uh, historical um, space exploration. Uh, for tonight's session, we're looking at a little bit of uh, satellites, what's up in the June sky. Uh, Bert is going to talk about uh, Posidonius and uh, uh, the uh, Coma Cluster, uh, while, uh, whoops, that we did not change. Um, it will be uh, globular star clusters. Uh, and um, we'll also mention some a couple of double stars that are available for binoculars, and then I'll uh, touch on noctilucent clouds. So satellites, uh, we have uh, thousands and thousands upon them that uh, orbit the Earth, but uh, by far the brightest and most obvious one is the International Space Station. And it takes about 90 minutes to orbit the Earth, and it's one of the brightest things up there that moves. It moves with about the same speed as a high-flying jet aircraft. Uh, apparent speed in terms of how long it takes to cross the sky. And it's uh, by far brighter than any of the brightest stars. Uh, the only thing that gets brighter is Venus. And so where is it uh, for this month? And uh, we find we've only got uh, four more nights uh, to see it uh, in the evening, and then it's going to disappear and be doing daytime passes. But in the meantime, um, either uh, tonight, if we can get some gaps in the clouds. Uh, just be careful uh, when uh, you use uh, the Heavens Above uh, website. Uh, sometimes you, you might see, oh, 27th of May is the tomorrow night, but it's actually after midnight tonight. So sometimes you've got to be a little bit um, careful about all that. But they are uh, local times once you set your location to Edmonton. So uh, here we are in a June sky looking south. The center of the chart is overhead, uh, which features prominently the Big Dipper. And 
The uh, will be focused on uh, this uh, sort of south to slightly southeastern sky. Uh, the International Space Station, uh, the nice thing from uh, the Heavens Above site is it also tells you what time to expect it in which part of the sky so that you can sort of be sure that, oh yes, that's the, the thing that I'm looking at. Uh, the other thing that's been making the news are the Starlink satellites. Uh, sometimes, uh, if, uh, if it's really favorable, it'll just be this chain of twinkling um, uh, disco balls uh, um, in uh, a short order uh, that uh, that moves across the sky. And it's uh, caught quite a few people off guard who are not used to uh, looking at the sky or seeing satellites. But uh, here we are in... Um, uh, late May, early June, where the sky is not dark, uh, even in the city. But uh, here we are uh, at 10.30 in the evening. Uh, and uh, the just as a reminder, we've done this uh, three times now, um, so uh, I think. Uh, but it's always uh, good to get a reminder. Uh, to find your way, use the curving arc of the tail of the Big Dipper overhead. So you arc to Arcturus, and then you spike to Spica. So those are among the two brighter stars in the sky uh, in the south. Now, uh, tucked away, a little uh, tougher to find, and certainly not quite at this hour. You have to wait till the sky gets a little bit darker, is uh, one of the featured stars uh, for uh, this evening's session. And it's got the wonderful uh, name Zubinel Genubi. Uh, the uh, for you Star Wars fans, uh, somebody ended up uh, writing a little uh, astronomy song, so it, because it rhymes with uh, Obi Ben Kenobi, Zubinel Genubi. Um, but we'll get into that uh, in a second as to why it was called that. Um, so Zubinel Genubi is actually the literal Arabic word meaning southern claw. And um, years ago, as in 2,500-ish years ago, um, there used to be no constellation called Libra, which is the balance or the scales. Um, and, um, and so at that point, it used to be the claws of the scorpion. The scorpion is just rising down here in the lower left. Um, and then it had these nice... Um, claws that you can see with the fainter stars when it's uh, dark out. Um, but uh, quite literally, uh, the name means Southern Claw. And the other star that you might mistake it with is the Northern Claw, which is Zubinel Ashmali. I'm not sure I've got the pronunciation quite there yet. But uh, Libra was uh, invented by the Romans. Um, because, as it turns out, when the sun is in that part of the sky, we are in the autumn equinox. So the equinox, meaning the balance between day and night, are equal. So um, they uh, essentially created the uh, a 12th constellation uh, in the uh, zodiac between Virgo, which is up here with Spica, and... Uh, Scorpius, which has got Antares, the bright red star, which will come out uh, next uh, month, really. Um, there's really not a lot going down in this uh, part of the sky. Um, so there's only really two stars that um, you'll uh, uh, see with your eyes. And in binoculars, Zubinel Genubi is, uh, is the one to look at. And um, Berta will be talking a little bit more about that. Uh, the other thing that's very prominent is this huge capital Y ending in Arcturus. So here's the Arc of the Dipper right up top again, coming down Arc to Arcturus. Um, Arcturus is the second brightest star in the northern sky, so nice orange giant. Uh, but there's this capital Y. And when I first started out observing, uh, I had a, an atlas and I just couldn't figure out um, where this capital Y, it's like there is no constellation that has this big capital Y. And eventually it uh, dawned on me as I was studying the charts a little more that, oh, this is actually two constellations. <laughs> One is Bootes, which is this sort of kite shaped and you can just make it out uh, from the city. 
So head of the kite up here and our churis being uh, the, the tail of the kite. And then the other part is the northern crown. And you really can't see this from the city at all other than the uh, bright light alpha uh, in uh, Corona Borealis. But under country skies, it's a very obvious uh, big uh, letter C. So um, the shape of a, uh, a crown. But for uh, for here, it's either the big Y or the uh, martini glass. Okay, and so now we move over to having a look at the moon. So over to you, Berta. Okay, um, hi. So uh, Alistair has uh, very nicely walked us through the uh, constellations uh, to be seen for the month of uh, June. Um, which is the first part, the constellations of bright stars is the first part of the Explore the Universe program. So we have selected some to be looked at um, for the month of June. And I'm going to walk you now through the, the moon uh, sections on the Explore the Universe program. Um, so uh, the, today we are going to feature one Maria and one uh, crater that are on the list of the Explore the Universe certificate. The Maria is Mare Nectaris, which is the one uh, shown there. Uh, this is how you will see the moon if you look at it with binoculars. If you look at it with a telescope, depending on your telescope, it could be either flipped or rotated. Uh, so, so this view of the moon is basically the way you see it by eye, if you are able to see the Maria if you have very good eyesight or, or binoculars that don't flip the image, but the telescopes uh, do sometimes flip or rotate the image. So, so just keep that in mind because you may not see exactly what we are seeing here. Um, but uh, if you look at the moon with binoculars, you will see in this view, and then uh, Mare Nectaris will be at the bottom of the moon, which is the Southern part. Um, and uh, is that Maria in there? Um, in this basin is around 350 kilometers at its widest point. Uh, and it's, an in, it's like, the, like the other uh, Mare, it's uh, also uh, was formed, it's an impact crater that was formed around 3.9 billion years ago when a big asteroid collid collided with the moon. And um, uh, uh, as a result of this collision, uh, lava started flowing into the, into the basin and filled it with uh, creating this rock, a rock called basalt that looks darker. And that's why we see these darker patches on the moon. These are areas where big asteroids hit the moon long, long time ago, around 3.9 million years ago. Uh, this is the smallest of the circular maria that we can see in the moon. And it still covers around 10 degrees of the lunar surface. Okay. And, uh, and if you want to see it, um, you can, the best day to see it is around day seven. So past the first quarter of the moon or around first quarter. But you can also see it from then and on um, until full moon, uh, this mare. Mare Nectaris. And now we move to a crater called Poisoidi, Pois, Posidonius. Posidonius. Um, this crater, which I have shown in the, in the slide, this is a picture of the five days old moon. Um, it's a picture that you can get from the NASA website. Um, so that's how the moon looks uh, when it's around five days and you measure the age of the moon by how many days it is away from new moon. So as it starts to be to become uh, waxing, it, um, we start counting the days from there. Um, so Posidonius is located at the north. Again, uh, remember that if you're looking with this with a telescope, the telescope we may have rotated the image upside down and then you may see it at the bottom, but it's up, up in the, on the moon, on the north part of the moon. Um, 
It's a big crater around 95 kilometers wide, and it has very irregular terrain inside. And so if you go to the next slide, uh, you can see actually a picture of this crater uh, that has a lot of features and is very eroded and has a little crater inside. So it actually has very deep walls and that's why it's so clear to be seen. And uh, the best time to see a crater is when the terminator, which is the area between light, between day and night in the moon, the, the edge, uh, that's the, the area that Alistair is pointing out, the, day be, the area between light and dark. When the terminator is very close to the crater, we see all the shadows of the walls and that makes it very clear to be seen. Whereas if the terminators have moved away from that crater, the crater may appear washed out and it's a little bit more difficult to see their features. So the best day um, in the moon cycle to see this crater is around the fifth day. Uh, when the terminator is in the area where the crater is. Thank you, Alistair. Um, I think that's that for the moon. Uh, sorry, one of the things uh, that um, uh, I remember reading about this is someone uh, had um, asked the question, what are all those cracks there? And it's, if anyone has uh, ever baked a pie without putting um, vents or slots in the crust to let the steam out, uh, your pie will puff up. And then when the heat is removed, the uh, crust will collapse back down. And so uh, essentially uh, the lunar scientists figure that's, uh, that's how it got these cracks, the same kind of thing, the lava underneath when it boiled in formed a, a crust. And then when the lava subsided underneath the crust just collapsed back down. Thank you, Alistair. I didn't know that. Um, interesting. So, um, mm -hmm. so um, then if we passed the, the section up, up from the moon, we go into the section of the deep, deep sky objects in the Explore the Universe certificate. And uh, for this month, we have selected two um, globular clusters. So one note that I wanna make though, is that um, this time of the year in Alberta is not the best time to be looking at the sky in general, um, because uh, it gets dark really late and the astronomical time is actually a little bit later than the sunset time around maybe one hour, Alistair, if, mm -hmm. yeah, around one hour later. And then uh, again, the astronomical light time finishes around one hour earlier than the sunrise because then there is a twilight time in between, which is bright enough to not, to obscure the, the objects in the sky. So this is not the best time <laughs> on the year. So I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know exactly now, but Alistair will know how many hours of astronomical darkness do we have right now? Zero. Zero. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> yeah, not until uh, August first is when we start getting dark again. That said, um, I always uh, maintain that even with the uh, midnight twilight we have here, it was better than my dark sight. Uh, just outside of Montreal. So you can still see a lot if, uh, but the window is really narrow from about midnight 30 to 2.30. And <laughs> that's what we've got to work with that's until what got to work August. With. Okay, now that being said, M13 and the other globular cluster that we are gonna talk about, M5, uh, they're bright enough. So maybe correct me if I'm wrong, because when I saw them, I saw them in Spain. So. Um, it was a little bit more dark than here, but I assume you can still see them uh, here oh, yes. at this time of this year because they are bright enough. So even in the twilight, you can see them. Um, so the first um, uh, globular cluster that we're going to talk about is M13, which is normally the one that everyone talks about when you want to see a globular cluster, people will go to M13. It's really bright. And um, in the summer sky is really high up in the southern sky. So it's very easy to see uh, and very easy to find. 
I'm just looking at my chart. Yeah. So, so um, it is, you have to locate the constellation Hercules, which is the one that um, Alistair is circling around. And there is um, an asterisk with the, within this constellation, which is called the keychain, which is made by those four stars that make kind of like a trapezium shape. And again, I actually don't know if you can see them from the city. Uh, again, when I saw them, I was in Spain. So it, it, it varies. Uh, the more closer to downtown, uh, not a chance, but more into the suburbs, they're just flickering on the edge of uh, visibility. Mm -hmm. That's true. Now that you think about, I think about it, I've seen them too from the observatory uh, at the U of A. So I, yeah, I think, anyway, we certainly have seen M13 from there. Um, and so once you locate those four stars, if you, if you can, and you could maybe get it started from the very bright star in Libra, uh, which is called Vega, and that is very clearly seen. Maybe, uh, yeah, thank you for pointing to it. So that's Vega. And so from there, you can basically walk your star hop with your binoculars until you find these four stars that make the asterism called the keychain in Hercules. And then from there, you can find N13, which is basically about one third from, from those two stars. Um, one third from mu. Um, and so M13 will appear like a fuzzy patch. If you look at it with binoculars, it will just be like a fuzzy, uh, not so well-defined cloud in the sky, a round fuzzy patch, which may be a little bit brighter in the core than towards the edges. If you look at it with binoculars, you can start making out the stars inside. Um, no, sorry, with my note. If you look at it with telescope, then you could be able to see sun stars in this um, uh, cluster. So this is a well-known globular cluster and contains hundreds of thousands of stars. Uh, so you should look for a fuzzy star south of the Eta, the northeast northwest Keystone star. And so note the magnitude seven stars on either side of this cluster. And this cluster is around 22 thousand light years away from us. Um, and globular clusters, just for the, just, just to explain what they are, because we're going to talk about two different ones, are actually tightly bonded, uh, are tightly bonded together by gravity and contain very old, mostly red stars. Globular clusters are very interesting because they're just these balls, conglomerated balls of stars, and they're very old, and they're normally not in the plane of our galaxy, but kind of outside of the plane of the galaxy. Um, I don't know exactly why the astronomers, uh, astrophysicists will know, but I know it's a very interesting object and they can be almost as old as the galaxy. So I don't know if they actually form with it or they were captured, I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, if you go to the next slide, Alistair, please. Uh, okay, whoop. Maybe I'm I should, slowly. There it is. I should lower the, the resolution in the future. So um, several members from the um, astronomy group here from Edmonton have taken pictures or sketched this cluster. And I asked them for, for pictures or sketches, and they provided this to me to illustrate in this slide. So, you know, it's a very beautiful cluster with lots of stars inside. And as you can see, the images on the left and the top one on the right are pictures that different members have taken. All these people, Ton Owen, Abdur, and Murray, are members of the Edmonton uh, um, RASC uh, chapter. And then the image or the sketch at the very bottom is done by Eric Klaus, who lives in Calgary. And uh, he's an amazing sketcher. And uh, that's how he saw it. This is a sketch of what he saw through his eyepiece. So those are really beautiful. Um, and so you can note the two bright stars at either side that are, were mentioned, seven magnitude stars in these images. They are all in there. And again, because every telescope rotate differently, um, they are all in a different position because these are all different rotations of the same image. Um, so thank you, Alex, there. So, now we can move to N5. 
Um, so M5 is another globular cluster. Um, this one is in the constellation Serpents, um, uh, Serpents Caput, uh, which is just very close to Arturux um, that Alistair had mentioned before. The yeah, Arcturus would be just off the map here. And here's that big Y Martini. The other mm -hmm. one is off the map that side, but it's here's the mm. left side of the, the Y would be there. Mm -hmm. And so N5 is also as bright and big as the most famous F M13 that we have mentioned before. Uh, and is located about two and a half binocular fields north of Beta uh, Lirae. Uh, this is the constellation Lira is just down there, Lyra, that Alistair had mentioned before too. Um, and similarly to M13, it's around 20 to 24 light years away from us. And this globular cluster is around 13 billion years old. So it's one of the oldest globulars in the Milky Way, but they are all very old. So, so, so they are, yeah, the 13 billion years old. So certainly almost as old as our galaxy per se. Um, if, if I can, Berta, one of the other ways to find this, because it's in a little bit of a dead space in the sky, is there's a whole chain of stars. There's another run down towards the lower left here. That's almost a perfect line going, covering a huge swath of the sky. And uh, this one is, is obvious because it's a, a nice pair and it's just the next pair up the chain. That's the one to lock onto before you then use that and just imagine the, uh, the, your pointy triangle from your geometry set and M5 mm -hmm. is right there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alistair. Yes, that's um, actually how to find things in the sky is always a tricky thing, especially if they don't have bright stars nearby. So, so that's for me tricky, but fun. That's one of the funnest parts because sometimes when you walk around the sky, you find little beautiful stars making amazing shapes. And, and that is sometimes the most beautiful part of it. And so again, like M13, um, I've been provided uh, pictures and sketches from members of the Edmonton Rask Society uh, from M5. And so you can see the two images on the left are uh, pictures of this cluster. And the sketch on the right is a sketch of M5. Uh, um, so again, these are, it's a really beautiful group of stars in the sky. All right, thank you. So if we don't have any more questions from anyone about the moon or the deep sky objects, then I can uh, move to, to the double stars, which is another section of the Explore the Universe certificate is uh, double stars. So we are gonna talk about two. The first one is Subelnel. <laughs> Maybe Alistair has to do it. Zubinel Janubi, Obi Ben Kenobi. Zubinel. Yeah. Okay, Zubinel Janubi. Uh, so that one is actually a double star in itself. So there are two stars. Just as a reminder, double stars in the sky can appear because uh, sometimes they just by chance happen to be very close to each other from our point of view, but they are actually very far from each other in the sky. But sometimes double stars are actually stars that are gravitationally linked and they orbit around each other. So there are different kinds, types of double stars. And uh, these ones is believed that they form a physical system and they appear to be moving together in the sky. Um, so this star is around 277 light years away from us, this group of stars. Um, they have different colors. So look for that when you look, when you look at them. The color of a star is not so clear by eye. It starts being a little bit more clear by, by, with binoculars. It's, it becomes more obvious with a telescope. But when you have two stars together that have different colors, it actually makes it way more easy to, to actually identify their colors. So that's one of the beauties of double stars, especially if they have different colors, that they will jump at you um, more easily than if you were seeing the star alone. Um, and another curious note is that 
themselves, each of these stars are spectro spectroscopic binaries. So in total, there are four stars in this group, although by eye or telescope or binoculars, we can only see two of them. Um, and if we move to the next one, thank you, Alistair. And then the another uh, pair uh, is this mu, mu one, mu two in Bootes. Um, and in these ones, um, it's a nice con contrast of magnitudes. So they have similar color, but they have different magnitudes. So one is more bright than the other. So that makes it interesting to these kind of stars. They are around 121 light years away. And one of them is 4.3 4 in magnitude and the other one is seven in magnitude. And so 4.3 is more bright. So, you know, the magnitudes of the stars, one means really bright and even and like zero. And then there is minus, uh, Alistair will know better. I think Sirius was supposed to be one, right? Ma when or Originally, yes. Originally, uh, but then sometimes of planets like Jupiter are actually brighter than Sirius in the sky. And then they, they gave them negative numbers. Uh, but the magnitude goes from one, which is very bright, to lower, which becomes dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. And if you see negative, it's, this is actually brighter than the brightest star in the sky, which is OK. The brightest star in the sky, technically speaking, is the sun. But <laughs> the brightest star in the night the sky is Sirius. So that's the one that has magnitude one. Um, so, <clears throat> So mu2 is magnitude 7, which will be the dimmest of the two, and it, it itself is a binary system. So we are looking at three stars. Um, and I think that's that. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Berta. Um, in this last segment, I'll talk a little bit about noctilucent clouds, wonderful leftover from Latin for us, but it literally means night shining. Uh, as you know, nocturnal animals are animals that go at night, and so that's the noct part, and lucent is uh, glowing or light, so uh, night shining clouds. And so here are two typical views of what uh, an average uh, noctilucent cloud display might look at or uh, appear to be. Um, so you need to be looking north well after sunset, so deep twilight, uh, which is uh, basically any time uh, after 11 o'clock uh, at the moment. And you'll notice normal clouds are dark because the sun has set and uh, normal clouds down in the lower bit. Um, so the normal clouds are dark, but these clouds lie 80 kilometers up. So the, the sunlight is still shining on the upper part of the Earth's atmosphere. And if there are these clouds uh, present, so they, they shift around. Um, and uh, you might think, oh, those are just cirrus clouds that are still lit by the, uh, the late evening uh, light. Uh, but um, the, the typically they will have um, a, a much sort of whiter and bluer uh, appearance to them. Uh, sometimes, uh, like this top one, they're fairly distinct. Uh, a lot of times they're they're quite subtle uh, and just um, sort of like, oh, something there. Uh, and uh, But uh, when they do get uh, really bright, you get things that look like this. And uh, you can see at the top one, this is a wide angle picture. I shot this from Valley View Drive, so near the Valley Zoo, looking downtown. Um, and so I, I had to uh, make a panorama that was uh, such a huge, bright display. And you absolutely cannot miss this. Um, I remember photographing one similar to this, and uh, some fellow was, was um, on Saskatchewan Drive, just across from downtown, he, uh, he saw a few of us taking pictures and, and this fellow on a bike just rode up and said, is there something wrong with the sky? It looks broken. <laughs> and uh, so I, I said, uh, sort of like five points for actually looking at the sky and seeing that there's something different going on. Um, and so uh, these are, um, 
it, it's they're very similar to the uh, high flying cirrus clouds um, and they're made of ice crystals and uh, what scientists have de uh, determined is that um, essentially high in the sky there's lots of meteor dust uh, when when meteors burn up in the sky it's uh, up at that uh, kind of altitude 80 to 50 kilometers up um, oh, for reference, a typical jet plane flies about 10 or 11 kilometers. This is 80. And the, the International Space Station is more like 400. So there's still um, uh, atmosphere up there. And um, the ice crystals or the water vapor, pardon me, in the uh, upper atmosphere condenses out as ice crystals on these um, tiny uh, meteoric dust particles and uh, gives us uh, ice clouds. Uh, and um, so when uh, they, they evolve very, very slowly, uh, you need a time lapse really to see them move, but they look just like uh, waves moving across an open ocean. And whenever you get uh, something that's uh, this bright um, is uh, get a pair of binoculars and scan it and you you just get to see uh, just this amazing amazing amount of detail uh, in them um, it's like looking at a, a Hubble Space Telescope picture of the Orion Nebula uh, it's just absolutely stunning and you just take um, you know, uh, five minutes to do a slow scan of the entire cloud and then do it again because it's just so beautiful. Sometimes those clouds um, are called well, electric blue, and it's just yeah, that doesn't look like normal cirrus clouds. So uh, these um, this phenomenon um, is uh, perfect for seeing um, right here in central Al Alberta because if you're farther north in summer. Well, it's permanent daylight. The sun doesn't even uh, set. And so the sky is too bright. Um, they're there, but you just can't see them. And then further south, um, it gets um, too dark. And so you don't get to see them except for uh, some uh, very extreme cases. But here in Alberta, we might see um, upwards of uh, uh, 20 to 30 of these during the season from, well, now, uh, late May into um, the end of July. The, the peak is right on uh, Canada Day, July 1st, and quite often uh, people's first experience of seeing noctilucent clouds is once they finish watching the Canada Day fireworks, it's the, oh, look, there's the sky looks really unusual. And some of them twig enough that, yeah, this is not just normal cloud. Um, and so uh, that's uh, a, a short introduction to these wonderful night shining clouds, which uh, we get here in Alberta. So I believe that is that. Oh, right. And uh, the, the website, um, uh, to look for is uh, NLCs, that's what Noctilucent Clouds, nlcplanner.com, um, where um, you just um, essentially hit, hit a button and it'll generate uh, tonight's events. And you're essentially looking um, for the start of the time when the sky is um, starting to get dark, when the sun is four to six degrees below the horizon. The best times, like when those photos are taken, are when the uh, sun is nine or 10 degrees below the horizon. So for now, this is at uh, universal time, which is six hours out. So this is uh, uh, 11.30 for us uh, for if, tonight. If it's clear and you're out at 11.30, uh, you, would, you might get a chance uh, to see them. So these numbers change uh, across the seasons as we approach. Uh, uh, June 21st solstice. So uh, that's why I created this uh, timetable because uh, uh, very quickly this um, time for when to start looking uh, for noctilucents. Um, this is will be 10 past 10 in the evening and very quickly over the next uh, month it, uh, it goes much later and it's much closer to 11 o'clock. Uh, but uh, that is uh, that. So uh, questions, and I'll uh, just back up the 
there because it's nice to look at, but uh, by all means, um, unmute yourself and um, um, ask, uh, ask away if, uh, if you have any uh, questions. And you could also ask in the chat if you rather do that. Yeah, one of the uh, neat things about uh, Noctilus and Clouds is they've been uh, becoming increasingly prominent in the last uh, decade. Um, and it's not just because more people are watching, uh, but uh, they seem to be occurring uh, farther south than usual. So no one's absolutely sure that they're related to uh, climate change, but um, that's uh, uh, part of uh, the, uh, the, the questions that the scientists are asking about it. Um, maybe one quick note, Alistair, what about the planets this month? Um, oh, uh, yeah. Um, well, th that's uh, stay tuned for come back next week for uh, uh, yeah. Jeff Robertson's uh, What's Up in the Sky this month, and, and he'll tell you where the planets are. But there, uh, yeah, there are planets to, uh, to look for uh, Venus and Mercury in the evening, although Mercury is getting very tough now and Jupiter and Saturn in the morning. But Jeff will tell you uh, more closely uh, when and, and where to look for those. Thank you. But it'll, it'll take, uh, I'll have to wait till, uh, once we hit August, then uh, Jupiter and Saturn will be really nicely placed for us to look at. I have to get up pretty early to uh, see Jupiter and Saturn right now. So 3.30, 4 in the morning, so. Mm -hmm. And uh, Venus is still fairly low uh, on the horizon, but it is going to get a bit higher and then stay uh, in the same spot relative to the horizon uh, until um, August, or not August, um, late September, October, and then it'll start to rise up and it'll be a lot easier to see. So. Mm -hmm. But I can talk about that next week. Yep. Good stuff. Okay. Yep. Well, um, if uh, if that's uh, it, uh, thank you for joining us, and uh, we shall uh, see you well next week at uh, Jeff's. What's up in the sky this month? And uh, next month, uh, a month from now, we'll, we'll talk a little bit uh, more about what uh, what to see in the twilight sky in Edmonton. Okay. Have okay. a good evening, everyone. Oh, yeah, thank you very much to all Thanks, of you. Alistair. Oh, you've got a. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you oh. very much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Alistair. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Good night. Bye.